Good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you so much for attending this event. It's, it's great to um, see a bunch of you and, and to have you join our discussions. Uh, my name is Teresa Almeida Krav, and I will just make a very short introduction of the research project within which this uh, lecture is being held. And then I'll pass on the, the floor to um, Clara, Maria Clara Olivaria, who's going to introduce our um, speaker and then um, Professor Oliver Richmond will, will take this floor as well. So this, this project, um, so this workshop is um, called New Trends in Peace and Conflict in the Case of Mozambique. And it's basically the, the, the project is a research project called Replay Approaches to Peace and um, approaches to peace and uh, the reproduction of violence in Mozambique. And it's a scientific research project held at the Center for Social Studies at University of Coimbra. And uh, the project started in January 2022 and has the duration of 18 months. Um, it's a project in the field of political science um, and it's funded by the Portuguese Foundation for Science and Technology. Um, the project is coordinated by uh, me and co-coordinated by, by Paulo Duarte Lopes, who is um, the co-PI of this project. The team also includes um, Maria Clara Oliveira, who will be um, chairing this, this lecture um, event, and then also Bernardo Teles Oliveira, um, Ricardo, from Mozambique, Ricardo Raboco and Isidoro Jacob Valia, and also Pedro Fidalgo and Jessica Santos from uh, and from also SESH. Um, so this, this project comes from um, this main idea, which is the fact that Mozambique was long considered uh, one of the few success stories in Africa in both the academic and the policy-making worlds following the end of its 16-year um, civil war involving Filimo and Renamo. And the label was earned largely due to its peace process, in particular its 1992 peace agreement that well, had been preceded by an international mediation and then followed by a UN peacekeeping mission. And the whole country's sort of political and economic transition thereafter. Um, this was supported and funded by the international community and it garnered significant academic attention and Mozambique's trajectory from a war on society to one holding democratic elections, achieving extraordinary economic growth, granted the country a special status amongst donors and academics alike. Some were voicing concerns all along, in particular regarding Frelimo's, the government, um, the government's hegemonic rule, and also a lack of broad-based development. But these critiques sort of remained on the margins and were sort of relegated to the category of fixable problems. However, the renewal of armed hostilities between the two former belligerent parties in 2013, some 20 years after the peace agreement, challenged the purported success of the settlement. And then in recent scholarship on peace and conflict revealed problems with the approach that had emerged in the 90s and of which Mozambique was actually a leading example. So the binary opposition between war and peace uh, gave way to a more nuanced understanding of continuities between wartime and peacetime, uh, the centrality of power sharing agreements reflecting formal pacts between political elites has been questioned, with a new focus on the need to empower and mobilize local actors and resources. And moreover, counterinsurgency and counterterrorism approaches geared towards imposing military victory had also been criticized at best as insufficient and at worst as um, counterproductive. So what's interesting is that, however, Mozambique's most recent peace process since 2013, with the agreement being signed in August of 2019, and the government's approach to Islamic militancy in the north, appear to be sort of out of sync with these recent findings, and they've been reproducing aspects of frameworks and practices that have reinforced structural and direct violence, as opposed to a comprehensive, multidimensional and empowering peace process. So by contrasting new developments and innovative insights in scholarly and policy-oriented discourses in the field with Mozambique's recent peace process and its continuing strategy to fight Islamic fundamentalism, this project addresses the following research question. So what understandings of violence and peace and which actors and interests are shaping Mozambique's policies and with what implications for the country's future? So basically the 30th anniversary of Mozambique's 1992 peace agreement is bound to be marred by ambiguity. Some will continue to celebrate the agreement's initial apparent success and almost two decade absence of armed violence between the former um, belligerents. Others though will question such an achievement in light of the return to armed violence perpetrated by Fulam, Fren, Renamo and then the Fralimo government um, in, and the armed violence perpetrated by jihadists in the Northern province of Cabo Delgado since 2017, which actually 
threatens as well to expand. So we sort of need to understand what's been happening here in terms of um, theoretical policy making and also um, empirical um, aspects. So we're trying to sort of analyze the current Mozambican government peace process with Renam on one hand, its response to Islamic fundamentalism in Cabo Delgado on the other, in order to understand the distinctive conceptualizations and implementations and outcomes so far, as well as their impact in um, terms of Mozambique's transition to a sustainable peace. So the idea is to set the context in the country's earlier peace agreement in 1992 on one hand, and then sort of contrast it with developments in peace and conflict literature and policy on the other. Um, and just sort of very briefly, we're trying to address the literature gap on the transfer or lack thereof of academic and policy knowledge and developments to concrete peace processes on the ground, and also to contribute to knowledge to the structural violence permeating Mozambique society, specifically in the center and the northern regions. Um, and then very specifically, we're looking at the current peace process with Renamo and then the strategy to counter the jihadist advances in Cabo Delgado. So just to sort of sum up the theoretical aims are in terms of trends of the literature on peace processes and relapsing violence in terms of policy making understanding also the terms and the trends in terms of hegemonic and counter hegemonic understandings and practices that can be reflected then for the empirical aims in further knowledge on the current peace processes and reaction to violence in Mozambique so with this in mind um replay has several outputs one of them is the lecture series which is starting this week with um our very distinguished speakers oliver richmond today with a talk on the international dynamics of counter peace strategic developments ideology and emancipatory alternatives and tomorrow with professor devon curtis on peace negotiations and the depolitization of inclusivity so i hope you um help us you know and discussing these subjects and come up with interesting avenues of research. And again, thank you so much for um, being part of this. And I'll pass the floor to Clara. Thank you, Teresa. Hello, everyone. Thank you for attending today's event. As Teresa mentioned, uh, today's lecture is part of a series of lectures that will occur in the frame of replay. Our first, first lecture will be given by Professor Oliver Richmond. Um, Professor Oliver Richmond is research professor in international relations and peace and conflict studies at the University of Manchester. He is also um, international professor at Dublin City University, distinguished visiting professor at the University of Tübingen in Germany and visiting professor at the University of Coimbra. Uh, he has received, uh, he received distinguished uh, scholar award from the ISA Peace Studies section in 2019. And his publications include uh, The Grand Design, The Evolution of the International Peace Architecture, Peace Formation and Political Order in Conflict Affected Societies and Failed State Building. He is also co-editor of the Paul Grave book series, Rethinking Peace and Conflict Studies, and co-editor of the journal Peace Building. Uh, we are very pleased to have you here today with us. Oliver, the floor is yours. Thank you very much for that uh, kind introduction. Uh, I wish I was there um, <laughs> after the day I had yesterday. But anyway, trying to get, trying to get out of the UK these days is um, extraordinarily difficult. Um, anyway, enough of that. <clears throat> Thanks very much for um, inviting me to give a, um, a short talk. And I should say that this is quite preliminary and um, it, it, it connects with the kind of trajectory of my previous research, um, obviously. Um, but I think things are sort of stepping up a gear um, in, in some ways, and I'll try to explain why. So <clears throat> I you know, started like many researchers working on, on single or comparative case studies and doing a, a lot of empirical work. And looking back at the kind of longer view of, of that work, um, I have to sort of um, think that the, the sort of critiques that were being mounted, you know, in, in the early work, I was doing a critique of, of international peacemaking mediation in, in Cyprus and Sri Lanka and a few other places like this. And I, I was looking back operating within the parameters that had already been scripted by what was becoming known as a sort of international peace building um, community. So, so the critique was about how to make this work better. And there was a sense that, you know, out there in the ether waiting to be discovered, there would perhaps be, be alternatives, but these things were you know, too complex and too far away 
um, for us to ever really reach. So the, the goal of, of, of that kind of critical research was to highlight the inconsistencies and inadequacies and the um, hypocrisies, if you like, of both very bounded methodological and ethical theorizing and practice. And as things developed, and I, I got involved in, in different cases and, and read more widely across different disciplines and historically and, and so on, um, <clears throat> I've begun to wonder about wider patterns in international peacemaking. So that's, that's where um, I've come to. I've just finished a book, which I, I think I had presented a very early draft of um, in Coimbra, probably just before the pandemic, um, called um, the International uh, Peace Architecture, the Grand Design, the Evolution of the International Peace Architecture. And I'll just outline that before I explain what I think um, has been happening side by side with this e e evolution. So the kind of broader premise is that there's this sort of historical framework that has been emerging after war and new types of um, conflict have emerged, then we've um, seen always after the event, um, attempts to deal with those conflicts. And those attempts have left a kind of sediment um, in, in the international system over the last um, several hundred years. And I, I don't want to take you on to, a, I mean, much of this story is known, you know, it, it runs from the Congress of Vienna to um, R2P, um, you know, effectively, or as one um, wag would put it, from Plato to NATO. And it's kind of constructed a very broad ranging, rather Eurocentric um, and um, quite technical um, international architecture for making peace. And every new layer was kind of clamped onto an old um, dynamic of war, whether it was geopolitical war by balancing, whether it was the collapse of, of colonial empires and the emergence of new social movements with the self-determination and democracy after World War I, the emergence of, of labor and social movements and um, very concerted decolonization movements um, in the Cold War period. Then of course, the liberal peace, then state building. And today we are um, in a kind of phase where we're not sure um, how to understand these new types of conflict, which have many different dynamics and therefore we're not re really sure how to to respond to them and each of those dynamics and processes over time have built up an international architecture i've been calling it an international peace architecture and it's sort of broad and wide-ranging and it's much bigger than the un system it it goes across it transgresses the lines of formal and informal politics it includes non-state actors and social movements as well as ngos transnational networks um, and so on, but it also includes the geopolitical powers, um, the Security Council and the General Assembly. Um, it includes critical thinking as well as liberal thinking, as well as realist and, and Marxist thinking, as well as post-colonial and decolonial thinking. <clears throat> so if we sort of take a step back from all of that, I mean, it's a huge field to try and put some sort of stamp um, onto, but I'm going to try, okay? So what I think we've seen happening is that as war has become larger and larger in scale and more and more existential, we have seen the acceleration of attempts to embed in an increasingly institutionalized international order tools for, for blocking wars, for preventing them, as well as for mediating peacekeeping and peace building. Um, in conflict affected societies for doing development, for starting to deal with the wider range of issues that go far beyond the sort of negative peace thinking of, of the early um, contributions to the discipline of peace and conflict studies and international relations and more broadly. Now, each of these um, layers in, in the international peacekeeping is like an archaeology. They've built up over time, and you can sort of look down through them in reverse. Um, and you can see um, how they're very contradictory. So what we have built up is a kind of reactionary order, an international peace order, where the peace tools and the theories are emerging and developing and um, 
um, engaging after the event of war. And the peace architecture is always prepared for the last war, the previous war, and not really for future wars. And each one of these layers, and I've, I've counted six actually, um, in, in historical terms of this international peace architecture, are kind of balanced in a very unstable way um, on, on top of each other. And this is an intergenerational historical system, which brings together many diverse and contradictory elements. And I think in some ways that's been its strength. It's become more complex and far more broad ranging over time. Um, and it has been able not to resolve contradictions, but to respond to them just enough to keep the foundations and the previous layer in place while the new wars emerge and bubble up. And then we start to turn our attention to, to how to deal with those, those wars. So it's kind of archeological sediment of tools and systems and approaches to thinking about war and how to deal with it. But as I said, it's very, it's very fragile, it's very unstable. It's little understood. We barely noticed its emerge, emergence um, in, in many ways. Um, and it requires a lot of service, a lot of energy, a lot of resources, a lot of um, engagement, a lot of political will. And of course, all of these things are extremely fluid in international history and in international order. So what we have um, is, you know, the constant ev evolution of war and violence in the international system. And this very sort of delicate and furtive evolution of tools to, to deal with peace, which grapple onto those systems of, of war and violence and try to stabilize them. Often they legitimate themselves by making more grandiose claims for emancipation, for, for freedom, for rights, for democracy, for development. Um, and so on and so forth. But it's essentially an un unstable system. <clears throat> now, so that, that's a sort of, you know, Whiggish linear historical view of the, of the evolution of the international peace architecture. And what we can do is we can fit various tools that we have into that system, like diplomacy, like the balance of power system, like um, peacekeeping or counterinsurgency or, or development or international mediation and diplomacy negotiation conflict resolution, transformation, you know, all of these tools, they sort of came out of a particular epoch of that system, a particular layer, to try and deal with the emissions of the previous layer, the bits of the conflict that had kind of escaped. You know, the conflicts, uh, uh, systems that had dealt with, I don't know, military security, but hadn't put in place a constitutional settlement. Um, you know, so then you have a kind of attempt to build a new sediment in this um, architecture. So one caveat here, we know um, from thinking outside the discipline that when social and political systems evolve in this way, they tend to become very unstable over time and they tend to sort of lose their salience in, in contemporary thinking, strategy and um, practice. And as, as that happens, there's a loss of legitimacy. Even if the system is still doing its job, it tends to lose legitimacy. So in every stage of this building of an international architecture, you see that the different layers are becoming kind of moribund or perhaps automated, you know, that they, they work in a fashion without too much attention. You know, in, in, in a way, you could think that the UN system is moving in that direction too. So I think we can build that picture fairly clearly now, but what we don't have a good picture of is a similar system around war and violence. I mean, what is it that makes war and violence continually re-emerge or reinvent itself as a political tool? And I think we in, in international relations and peace and conflict studies haven't been very good at this. You know, we've been pretty good at either kind of making nihilist statements about realism being the only way that we can understand the reality of world politics and therefore there's no possible progress and even if you try to move things forward those movements will inev inevitably create new conflicts and therefore become seen as naive systems 
<clears throat> so that, there's that sort of um, that's, that's the dynamic with um, thinking in international mm -hmm. relations, which is very much a, a sort of dominates the epistemological frameworks which we use for dealing with war. And therefore, what that prevents us from doing is thinking about how peace processes themselves operate in a war and conflict environment and what role and part they play in those environments. And I think we can kind of, you know, taking a fairly critical perspective, but married with the different layers of the international architecture and these different theoretical and epistemological approaches, take a more eclectic view of that and start to understand how politically speaking, strategically speaking, it's quite possible, if you like, to run um, a counter peace system within the international architecture with the aim of pushing back at that system, of marginalizing the amount of power resources and legitimacy or credibility that goes to one group or other, in this case, the ones associated with the international peace architecture itself. So what you have is a counterpiece framework. And I think you can see hints of this starting to be noticed um, in the literature um, in the sort of early post-Cold War period. I mean, obviously it was fairly clear in the Cold War that any peace was subservient to security interests. And because peace itself is essentially a political framework, suggests political change, then we couldn't do politics because it was touching on big questions of ideology. So the best we could do was try and dampen, refrigerate or mop up, if you like, um, the risks of escalation and um, create these kind of negative peace situations. When we get into the post-Cold War um, situation, we start to have this idea, a more scientific idea, you know, drawing on a long history of political theory and philosophy, that actually we can start to think our way um, through this problem. And it starts, we start to see, as I mentioned earlier um, today, an alignment <clears throat> under the conditions of hegemony um, between how many scholars thought about peacemaking, how international organizations, as well as transnational actors might operate, and how the hegemon was proposing the nature of peace should look like in terms of liberal democracy and, and the liberal peace and all, all that sort of thing. So we had for a brief period this alignment, a top-down alignment in which there was a kind of enabling um, uh, environment for a range of different areas of endeavor in peacemaking to move forward from civil society to constitution writing, to international law, to the development of civil society organizations as checks and balances, the formation of transnational networks. And of course, this then begins to open up um, a post-colonial um, requirement to think about difference in peacemaking, not purely in strategic terms, but in the whole range of other terms, ontological terms, epistemological terms, terms that went beyond the ideological. And as soon as this starts to happen, the, um, the kind of legitimacy of the international peace architecture is rocked. And the reaction of the West to this loss of legitimacy, we see in the kind of counterinsurgency, war on terror, stabilization, state building models that rapidly emerged that were a kind of retraction from the more grandiose claims of, of the international peace architecture. So what we start to see here are hints of counterpiece tactics within the international system. And you know, to put this in, in very simple terms, you can look at the range, the wide variety of stalemated peace processes that currently exist and have been going on for 30, 40 or, or 50 years. Frozen conflicts um, in, in the international system. Now, what this suggests, if you're looking at it from the international peace architecture side, is that the science and if you like the technology of, of peacemaking is inadequate. And we need to refine and hone those approaches. So improve international law, improve the UN system, improve peacekeeping and peace building and development um, and so on. And one of the ways in which the list just suggested we do that is to go to these local transnational networks 
And I think that's a good historical reason for doing that, which I'll, I'll mention in, in a moment. On the other hand, we're also seeing, um, and particularly from the more kind of mainstream literatures in the field, debates about things like spoiling and hurting stalemates um, and right moments. So very much more in this kind of strategic mode of, of thinking. And I think what's happening there is a kind of counter dialogue to the international architecture itself. What the international architecture is essentially doing is insisting a system-wide um, um, approach to checks and balances of power at the social level, at the state level, at the regional level, and at the international level. And it's saying that if we check and balance power, then we don't actually really need to deal with the underlying so-called root causes of conflict. And this is a very Eurocentric, you know, kind of uh, Anglo-American understanding of, of modern, the modern history of Whiggish politics. What we're seeing from the other side of the, of the table, if you like, is within that framework. So the international peace architecture has sort of um, moderated regional and international war, and it's turned its attention to civil wars. <laughs> and all of those checks and balances systems that are emerging, which are transcending the state system, and pointing us to debates about global governance, possibly global governments, transnational social and regional and political networks, transversality and so on. What they're doing is they're, they're saying, well, you have, to, you have to redistribute power and resources for peace. So it's starting to arrive at a root cause debate. What we're seeing at the, on the other side with these very small discussions of kind of uh, micro attacks on the international architecture, is a range of voices that are increasingly starting to say, but why, why should I give up my power? So you're asking me to, to basically um, destroy my power base in the name of peace, but I have a different view of things, perhaps different ideological, perhaps different cultural or ethnic perspective, or a different theoretical and epistemological perspective of things. So what we've been doing is we've been looking at the building up of this international architecture, without really having the full picture. And while that's been happening, we haven't noticed the building up of a counterpiece framework. The counterpiece framework, which is designed to negate and to push back at the international peace architecture. In other words, to preserve privilege, possibly to preserve territorial sovereignty, to push back at regionalization or transnational civil and social networks, and to undermine the production, particularly through international law, of some sense of, of basic norms and values that are possibly even enforceable. In other words, to reclaim power, it's like the return of the Ancien Regime. So I think what's happening in a lot of these peace processes that are stuck and blocked mm -hmm. over the last 20 years and more um, is that actors and individuals, ideological groups, groups that are claiming sovereignty, secessionist, irredentist, rump states and so on and so forth, are starting to make the argument that they have a legitimate version of peacemaking, which is initially brought about through a range of tactics which counter things like mediation and draw it out into the long term. So that there's gonna be no political settlement, which requires a disaggregation and decentralization of power, for example, through elections and the introduction of checks and balances and the empowerment of civil society, the joining of a regional organization and that kind of you know, liberal narrative of, of peacemaking. Or you can have counter peacekeeping where you have activities which are designed to keep pressure on peacekeeping forces, not, them, not to allow them to advance their mandate, but to simply keep it in this kind of hurting stalemate quagmire that we've seen so many peacekeeping operations um, arrive at. You can have counter reform processes, which are actually more, much more well documented in terms of how um, state reform and economic reform processes um, often um, have ended up in this kind of quasi or partial reform syndrome and so on and so forth. You can have the blocking of um, um, access of international organizations or regional organizations or transnational civil society networks into a conflict affected society. In other words, these are kind of spoiling tactics in the small scale that are starting to add up to a systematic opposition to a peace process. But what they're doing is they're maintaining the peace process at the same time. 
because it's the peace process, not the state, but the peace process that keeps violence in a large scale off the table and allows political maneuvering to take place. And that political maneuvering is aimed at rewriting the name, rewriting political order. So it doesn't conform to the kind of hegemonic liberal top-down script, which we saw being used as a platform, you know, um, throughout the 20th century, but particularly in the latter part for uh, more substantive and deeper forms of peace building. So I'd say that where we are now today um, in, in this dynamic, you know, you have this kind of opposition between an international peace architecture and a counter peace architecture is this counter peace framework, you know, which starts with political elites on the ground who oppose reform, economic elites who oppose redistribution, um, social elites who oppose a real deep dig into justice processes, actors who oppose intervention from outside, even if it's transnational social networks, ideological opposition, and so on and so forth. What we're starting to see is that they have built a process, a counter peace process, which is capable of sheltering within peacemaking and peace building, and those tools in the earlier layer of the international peace architecture, but is also capable of changing the direction of travel of that process. And the, the many stalemates and refrigerated conflicts that we saw over time, if you like, add up to an, to an attempt to, to redirect international order and its evolution itself. So this brings me to the kind of second part um, of my discussion. <clears throat> so, so what's their alternative? You know, what is the alternative of, so we can call these revisionist forces. And it's notable that you know, in, in the 2000s, we were all calling the BRICS potentially revisionist forces in peace building and international relations. And we were saying that they were possibly critical forces because they were also providing a platform for alternative social movements to come to the fore. They were challenging the neoliberal notion of the state and this kind of thing. But there seems to be a, a moment where some of them have become a bit more revanchist than revisionist. So it's, it's not just about, um, if you like, shifting the nature of international peacemaking and the international order that it maintains more towards their interest norms and values but it's also um, about rectifying a whole series of, of historical wrongs seen from very spe specific positionalities often imperial nationalistic or or ideological so what we're seeing here is the breakdown of the international peacemaking architecture it's been hollowed out from the inside and it's many tools from its civil society tools to its legal tools to its military tools to its developmental tools um, and so on it's many attempts to get beyond the delineation of politics through the sovereign state and territorial system and so on you know for obvious reasons to build dialogue to build reconciliation to start to deal with questions of justice um, are being pu pushed back because the costs are simply too high for many political elites in conflict affected societies, as well as an international order itself to accept. So if I'm right about this, and it is very broad brush, and I, you know, I, I can accept a whole range of criticisms um, against this sort of um, analysis, but if I am correct that this is kind of direct, direction of travel, where we're seeing ourselves now is shifting from this liberal hegemonic order which we're you know, talking about today and, and in many of the meetings I've been at recently with some nostalgia in some ways, because it was hegemonic, but there were platforms in which you could move a few things forward. Um, and there were many things about the offer that were quite attractive. But on the other hand, um, it was also hypocritical and it rapidly lost legitimacy because it didn't do what it promised, it didn't deliver. And it also very quickly collapsed into the interests of, of Western and principally American foreign policy. So you can see why those critiques are, are emerging. So we're shifting, as I said again this morning, we're shifting from a situation in which the international peace architecture and the counter peace architecture are kind of locked into each other and the counter peace is subservient to the international peace. The counter peace needs the international peace architecture to main, maintain itself and to augment its activities. We're shifting into, an, into a situation where the counterpeace architecture is taking over from the, the international peace architecture. The international peace architecture is kind of being compressed down 
into a previous layer of um, the international system and a new layer um, is emerging. So we've had that attempt to make peace by kind of enforcing or inducing common norms and values at a very basic level, which fell to pieces. And now we're faced with new eventualities, particularly as we're looking at you know, the wars of the 2000s, the war and terror period, the failure of state building, the emergence of stabilization thinking, um, and then you know, competitive moves in terms of international regional organization and, and, and um, institution building from different actors around the world. We're starting to see the emergence of different sites of the renegotiation of international order, so a multipolar system. So th this means that peacemaking now is moving into a new terrain where we have to think about a much more difficult task in many ways of making peace when there is acute and heavyweight difference. So it's not just in terms of local context and acute political difference in local context, as in civil or regional conflicts, but it's in terms of the broader ideologies of international politics and how they compete with each other over how they think about the individual, the community, the social contract, the nature of the state, and the point of international order itself. And I think that's a much more difficult task. And what it tends to do is it tends to push these tools like peacekeeping and peacemaking and peace building, mediation, development, back into a much smaller space. I mean, really what's left from this development probably is going to be very limited forms of diplomacy and mediation and um, ceasefire oriented forms of peacekeeping at best. Very hard to see a place for peace building because it would raise the question of, well, which ideological framework would you use for this grandiose task of rebuilding the state? Hard to see a place for state building unless the state really is just about the hard security wiring and the trading capacity um, of, of that state, which kind of lead, leads us back down that old state formation uh, kind of rabbit hole. It's hard to see a place for conflict resolution, transformation for the role of civil society networks, transnationalism or transversalism, because it effectively caps all of those activities underneath the geopolitical and elite interests of those who control the state and the, the, the new multipolar organizations that may well emerge in, in separate spaces. Okay, so what I've done so far is I've talked about some historical developments, you know, as we've seen in the international peace architecture. I've talked about something which we haven't been very good at understanding, I think, in the discipline, which is how opposition has evolved and legitimated itself within that framework. And I've talked about the consequences particularly for thinking about peace, peacemaking in, in a multipolar international environment in which there are multiple offers um, on the table. None of them are very credible. Most of them don't believe in the rule of law. Um, democracy has different, different fun uh, functions or has been subverted. Civil society is a problem, not a benefit, um, and so on and so forth. So the question is, what could scholarship do here? And I think that's for us, obviously, in this room, a rather important question, and, and it relates to, to the point of your project as well um, here. So let me make some very broad brush um, interventions there. In the evolution of the international peace architecture, every time a new layer of activity and new augmentations of the international peace architecture have emerged, whether it's the emergence of um, transnational social movements, disarmament um, organizations, whether it's um, about democratization or more social um, equality, or whether it's about developing new forms of constitution building, or about um, evolving international law, um, or building multilateral international organizations, I think you can pretty much track the evolution of that thinking in scholarship. Now, often, unfortunately, the scholarship has emerged several hundred years before um, the, the political environment, the, the crisis has emerged, which has given policymakers no choice but to adopt them because they're facing an existential crisis. And now in every phase of the development of the international peace architecture, 
there's been some existential crisis related to war or possible war, which has basically led policymakers into digging back through the scholarship that has emerged from that scholarly interaction with theory and methodology and transnational movements and, and ideology and so on. And they've picked out of that um, a, a range of actionable features which they can use to put a cap on the old war system and to try and build some stable order, at least for a time. And I think we're sort of faced with that situation again. So this, this sort of behoves us to look at the literatures again and to think then not just in terms of their critical value at, at various times in the evolution of more practice oriented approaches, um, but how do we turn them into practice? You know, what's in this thinking that's circulating around um, peacemaking right now that's waiting to be picked up to deal with war and violence as it currently is, which may also help us stabilize the existing international architecture. Because don't forget that many of the conflicts that the existing architecture as a historical edifice um, are, are dealing with are, are not yet gone, they're not resolved, they've never been transformed. So what's there? And I've been looking at the literature and thinking about this you know, quite a lot. And I, I have to admit, it's pretty slim pickings. Um, but I, I think it goes, you know, there are some common themes here um, in, in the literature where we can say, here are some possible solutions. And clearly it's identifying a problem, uh, an inconsistency or a par paradox or um, a, um, a contradiction in the existing architecture. And many of them are extremely familiar. So we see, you know, we see throughout the evolution of the international peace architecture, we see the development of transnational social movements, which network in scholars and international lawyers, constitutional lawyers, um, as well as some politicians and a few political elites. Now those transnational networks, which have historically been used to build different layers of the international architecture, have always transgressed sovereignty, centralized power. They've always, argued against systematic inequality in the global and domestic political economies of states, pointing to these features, not of agents of social Darwinism, but of agents of violence. Um, they have um, always reached for common, a common normative system and common normative values and effectively made the argument that norms travel, even despite sovereignty. They've always looked to, filled it, uh, to building um, supranational government. So they've always pointed to the state as a problem. I think that these are all sort of key areas where we can um, start to pick up to think about how we deal with the, the return of ideological conflicts, the conflict between liberal democracy and authoritarian nationalism that we see emerging, the anger that much of the global South feels towards the liberal democracies for failing to deliver over the last 30 or 40 years. The um, arguments that are being made in favor of, of a kind of near, near imperialist approach to um, international relations and what would that mean for peacemaking and peacekeeping and, and so on and so forth. So there are kind of elements there that we can pick out. And if I sort of push forward a bit into the, into the literature, the some more visionary and far-sighted thinkers, I think, um, are talking about questions of justice and sustainability. And again, that's always been there in the language um, of thinking about peacemaking, critiquing international order, looking at international history. And um, of course, it's had its um, outpouring into the terrains of political redesign, into the terrains of law and international law, um, and has acted as a platform for thinking about the expansion of rights. So we're talking here about a way in which we deal with these contemporary conflicts, these hybrid wars, these unannounced wars, the return of political violence as a political tool, the um, defanging of um, the UN system, of the development system, the building of alternative institutions side by side in different regions, um, and so on. And it sort of conforms with, I think, um, a lot of the logic of the peace and conflict studies literature, particularly the critical stuff, you know, which starts from the premise of, of of dialogue and often ends up with questions of equality, justice and sustainability. So you see 
you know, in, in literature on IPE, you see a lot of discussion about what they call plurilateralism. That is the kind of rejigging of, of um, the international political economy um, in, in ways in which you no longer have that kind of centralized IMF model disseminating its ideological and practical propositions into conflict affected societies, but completely rethinks how knowledge travels within the international system. The idea being that there's kind of horizontal as well as vertical networks, which inform, which inform policymaking, not just the sort of basic norms at the international level, coupled with um, Western interests, and of course, connected to the political will of donors to, to um, demonstrate and to, to contribute. You have from the post-colonial literature, which I think has been very important, a concept of pluriversalism. <clears throat> and the idea here, which also sort of tags on to um, the notion of a multipolar world, is that we need to rethink how we, how we understand law and norms and the tools which maintain um, international order in order to incorporate different life worlds that currently exist in the international system. And I think this also maps onto the ideological struggles that we saw really kind of tampered, tampered down at the end of, of the Cold War with sort of the emergence briefly of liberal hegemony and calls for a dialogue between those different um, positions and positionalities in the international system. We've seen historically throughout the emergence of the international peace architecture, as I've said, a kind of rejection of the artificial boundaries that go with imperialism and go with state sovereignty, a rejection of territorialism. We've also seen in a range of, of philosophical contributions, um, an emphasis on the broader dimensions of justice. That is, you can't think about peacemaking without dealing with historical questions of justice. And simultaneously, you can't think about peacemaking without thinking about distributive questions of inequality, both within society, but across the region and globally, which requires multilateral organization. It requires plurilateral engagement, and it requires pluriversalism in the sense that we have to think about different life worlds in a common project, and we have to mediate between them. So as opposed to that previous system where we're trying to build and convert, if you like, conflict affected societies to join the liberal international community, we're talking here about mediating acute diversity, acute inequality, and thinking intergener intergenerationally about questions of justice. We also see from, from the environmental literature too, and uh, you know, questions of environmental justice bring, being brought into the fray. Now, admittedly, that's very broad, and I need to wrap things up here, I think, but it's a very broad um, perspective. But if you do a little kind of um, you know, intellectual comparison here between the frameworks that we have for development, for peacekeeping, for mediation, for peace building, development, for thinking about the role of social movements and civil society, and you put them into the context of the sovereign state system, what you see is a lot of opposition and barriers to their oper operation and undermining of, um, of the science basically of the scholarship, which is suggesting how we move out of this very conf conflict prone um, system, this political order, which our tools of peacemaking cannot maintain. Whereas if you move them, those tools, away from that kind of, that kind of um, stalemated international peace architecture, counter peace architecture system, and you move them into this, this range of new contributions, then we can start to think about how these, how these um, tools could be revised and how they would be much more broad ranging and be able to deal with a much wider range of needs, of political claims, of subaltern voices, and therefore be able to re-legitimate any international order that they were um, appended to. Okay, <laughs> I mean, I, I appreciate this is you know, a, a big area of discussion and debate, but I think this is sort of a moment um, to do it in, because we've seen the leeching away of the legitimacy of the liberal order, and we've seen the rise of local, regional, and now global conflicts. We again face a number of threats that are basically existential, and we can measure that against the existing international system and see pretty much in no way is it able to mediate these pressures and dynamics. <clears throat> 
And historically, in the evolution of the international peace architecture, the way of dealing with that was for the production of new knowledge, which would be disseminated and would eventually reach the institutions, the political elites who would then engage in a series of reform, substantial structural reforms, which would be often spurred by those same individuals looking into the abyss of major systemic war or loss and violence. And I think we're sort of heading to that moment too, where political leaders will be looking into the abyss and they'll be looking for um, new approaches or additions. And it's pretty clear to me that they're not gonna revise the international system as it is, because that's never been done. But what they will try to do, if we, if we get to that point, is to build a new layer of this international architecture. So this would be a sixth or a seventh layer possibly. And this is, I think, a layer that we can focus on. So all of these case studies, all of this local data, all of this understanding of international law, the multilateral organizations, the peacemaking and all those systems and so on, we can be revising this and rethinking it in, in the context of these broader modes of thinking and the direction of travel of critical thinking about peace has always been to connect it closer and closer to justice and to broaden justice and therefore peace. I think over the entire evolution of this architecture, the direction of travel of the international counter peace framework has been to push back against that because it means a loss of privilege and resources and agency for many who disagree or don't see the point or come from a very different perspective. So the, the trick of this next phase is to, is to try and mediate these acute differences. I mean, that's the game of peacemaking, isn't it? It's not easy and you don't make peace with your friends, the old cliche goes, you make it with your um, enemies. And I think for peace and conflict studies scholars, what we need to do is move the debate on so that we have some sense of where, what we can offer and what we can do given all of these very problematic dynamics that we now face and the realities really of the failure of the liberal order and its rapid reversion to something which is much more um, you know kind of uh, relevant to what we saw in the, in the 20th century in, in different phases in different forms and we've no way of knowing which way it's going to go but what we do have is this international peace architecture which is much more substantial and we can perhaps build on that and I'll leave it there.